Hello, my name is George Trevino. I'm an academic advisor for the military programs, and I'm also a military disability representative for Penn State World Campus. For many veterans, the ADA is an important uh, facet for employment after the service. So a little background, before joining uh, the military, all members are screened to make sure that they meet the mental and health standards set forth by Congress. Once they completed uh, their time in service, some veterans are given disability ratings. And if the injuries are severe, it can hamper employment opportunities. So for those veterans, um, and in, in some cases, even those uh, with mental health issues, it could p potentially uh, create a roadblock to employment. And many of them uh, understand this. So veterans, you know, uh, gave all for their country. And when they're discharged from service, many are disabled and now they must find employment. The ADA is important as it levels the playing field in such cases so that it prohibits companies and organizations, uh, even the, the US government, from discriminating uh, these folks uh, that have disabilities so they can still find and engage in an employment. I was asked to just make a, a quick comment about uh, some of the things you're gonna hear tonight concerning disabled veterans. You see, I'm also a disabled veteran. One of the things that I need to mention so that you, because you may encounter, is that you might encounter a veteran that is just doggedly going after something that to maybe some people, it seems like they're really just will not give up. That's what's called the warrior mentality, okay? And oftentimes it catches even me. Uh, so I came up with a little idea of how to explain it to my civilian colleagues when they often sometimes wonder why, you know, veterans just will be doggedly trying to do something that in the face of it all knows that it might be an impossible task. I like to equate it to a thing that I call the Black Knight Syndrome. I saw it in the movie Mighty Python, the Holy Grail. So if you've never seen it before, you really should type in Black Knight uh, Holy Grail into Google and you'll get this little clip of this black knight defending a little stream against uh, King Arthur. Well, they have a duel and King Arthur is chopping off one limb after another. Eventually, it, it's just the black knight with no arms and legs bleeding everywhere and still doggedly trying to make the fight. You see, in our training as veterans, as military warriors, we're trained to go fight for our country. We're just never really taught to come home. So I'd like to leave this thought with you before uh, you start the presentation so that it might give a better understanding of the veteran warrior ethos and why sometimes it seems like we don't want to give up. I should know because my wife reminds me of the Black Knight Syndrome quite often. So with that, I gladly yield to the presenters and uh, I hope you enjoy this event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trevino. Hello, my name is Danita Wright Watson and I'm the Associate Director of Equity, Inclusion and Advocacy for World Campus Student Affairs. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to be here. So yesterday marked the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, providing change, inclusion, and equal opportunity for tens of millions of people. In celebrating this monumental act, we want, excuse me, we want to highlight the service of the gentleman who I have the privilege of introducing you to tonight. Mr. Ronald Drock is a subject matter expert in military and veterans issues with more than 50 years of experience. Mr. Drock medically retired from the U.S. Army in 1967 with a Purple Heart after losing his leg as a result of combat in Vietnam. Soon after, he focused his life on working to help his fellow 
disabled veterans. Following nearly three years with the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, he joined the staff of the Disabled American Veterans, or DAV, in 1970. Beginning in the DAV's Pittsburgh office, Mr. Drock rapidly rose to become the organization's National Employment Director in 1975. He was the first Vietnam veteran to be appointed a director at the DAV. In this post, he established the reputation he maintains today as one of the nation's foremost authorities on employment issues impacting veterans and others whose lives have been affected by disabilities. Mr. Drock's responsibilities led him to provide significant input into America's response to the need of veterans living with post-traumatic stress disorder, homelessness, racial and gender discrimination, and other socioeconomic issues. He became a leading voice on questions involving social security disability benefits, as well as efforts to remove barriers that impede the lives and employment of people with disabilities. Many times throughout his career, Mr. Drock has appeared before congressional committees offering expertise and recommendations for legislative change. I could continue to go on about Mr. Drock's selfless service to others, but I want him to share his story in his own words. So everyone, I am humbled and greatly honored to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Ronald Drock. So first, Mr. Drock, can you please just tell everyone a little bit about your background? Yes, but first, Anita, I would like to thank you uh, and Terry for putting all this together and helping out with all the technical aspects, but more importantly, just to invite me to participate in this event this evening. I'm very um, honored to be asked uh, to present this evening and to be interviewed on this issue of the ADA. Um, let, um, my background, basically, you just went through a lot of it. I was wounded in 1967, went to work for VA and then DAV. And um, I retired early from DAV in 1998. And then I went to work for the, I took a, what I call a four year weekend and went back to work four years later at the Department of Labor's Veterans Employment and Training Service uh, for another uh, eight years. And then I retired from there in 2010. And I've been doing some consulting and volunteer work uh, since that time. And I, I serve on a couple of different, uh, I serve, excuse me, my phone started to ring. Uh, I, I, I serve on a couple of nonprofit boards focusing on people with disabilities or disabled veterans. Thank you for that. And can you tell us a little bit about what it was like making the transition from your military service to civilian life? You know, that, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, I, I got discharged more than 50 years ago uh, at a time when uh, veterans were not very popular, particular Vietnam veterans. We were, we were stereotyped as druggies and baby killers and uh, just not good people at all. I was very, very fortunate in that, uh, as, in, as indicated in the intro, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, um, and I lived in a, in a relatively, you know, uh, good area in terms of uh, patriotism and whatnot. There wasn't any real dissension about the war in the neighborhood that I grew up in and that I lived in. Uh, so I, I was welcomed back fairly, pretty much with open arms. I had my, uh, of course, I had a life-altering injury and um, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Um, I was a high school graduate, uh, no, no college, worked in a steel mill uh, before I got drafted. Um, uh, and um, I was going home, I was single, I wasn't married. And so when I, when I got back to Pittsburgh, as I said, my friends were there, my parents were there, uh, my other family members were there, and they were all very supportive of me being rehabilitated. And as a matter of fact, I, I lost my right leg. Um, so driving, I drive since then and until today, I still drive with my left foot. And um, I was very nervous about it, but a good friend of mine, he had a 1955 
um, Oldsmobile, which was almost perfect. And nobody could touch that car except him. And he took me about 10 miles from our, where we lived. And he stopped and he got out and he said, you're driving home. And I was just blown away by his confidence in me. Another friend of mine uh, taught me how to walk on crutches because I was at Walter Reed and they sent me home uh, post-op uh, in a wheelchair. And I couldn't even you know, get, get anywhere without the wheelchair. Uh, so all in all, during all this time, of course, there was a lot of dissension going on in the country and a lot of veterans that I know now and knew shortly after I went back to work um, were affected, you know, adversely. They were spit upon. Uh, they were not welcomed back uh, very positively. And you jump ahead 50 years, or well, not even quite 50 years, to 9-11. And it's heartening. It's very, very heartening to me that this generation of veterans are being welcomed back so positively. Thank, thank you for that. And it, it's a shame that you went through that and that other veterans um, had that, that treatment. And I can't even imagine what it was like. You know, you, you put your life on the line for our country and then come back and be seen in such a negative manner. Um, I'm grateful that things are better now and that, that servicemen and women get the respect that they so rightly deserve. Um, I, I just wish that it didn't take so long for us to become appreciative and show gratitude. So I hope that you accept the gratitude that, that people show you now since you didn't get it back then. Um, I wanted you. to ask you, can you tell us exactly how were you impacted by the Americans with Disabilities Act and how, and how would your life have been different without it? Well, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. Um, over the years, uh, you know, again, as you mentioned, the ADA is 31 years uh, old. And so prior to that, uh, the only thing that we had any kind of protection under is under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And then it was amended in 1974. And it didn't really provide a lot of protections uh, but at least it, it was something to lay the groundwork for which ultimately became the ADA. What I watched uh, after I went to work in 1968, uh, mainly for disabled veterans and veterans in general, um, you saw a transformation went on in the country, slowly and slowly but surely. I remember when I first saw, started seeing curb cuts in Washington, D.C., and I thought, wow, this is great. Look at this for the people in wheelchairs are gonna be able to, to navigate better and so forth and so on. And I said, boy, I wonder what disability organizations uh, spearheaded this effort. And I went to find out that it was actually the DC Bicycle Association. Uh, the bicycle people wanted curb cuts so they could ride on the safely on the sidewalks. So little did they know what they were doing was really opening up an avenue for people with disabilities that used wheelchairs or maybe had other mobility impairments that made it difficult to step up on a curb or anything. So, and as I mentioned also, I had it pretty good when I came back. I've never faced discrimination. I've never had to worry about uh, any kind of work accommodations until 1998 and when I started to lose my hearing. So from, from 1967 to 1998, uh, my major disability was amputation, and I never had any problems. I had a sedentary job. I mentioned I had worked in the steel mill prior to being drafted. They offered me a, a job working in the office. They were going to retrain me, and that was they, they came to me. I didn't go to them, and I opted not to go back to the steel mill um, because uh, I, I would still have to work um, shift work and uh, weekends and so forth. And after being in Vietnam for a year, I wanted to uh, work nine to five, five days a week. Uh, so mm -hmm. I just held out for a while and finally got a job at the VA. So while I had an opportunity to observe the effects of the ADA, uh, and I saw it, how it impacted on a lot of friends. Over the years, I met a lot of people and became good friends with people that used wheelchairs, blind people, people that were deaf, uh, so I saw their world opening up more so than my world, uh, but I think the ADA has done so much for so many people, 
And let me go back to the curb cuts just for a moment. And you start looking at curb cuts and ramps that are go to entrance ways. Keep an eye on them. Next time you're, you're, you're watching, see who uses them. Bicyclists, delivery people that have um, uh, dollies, you know, with delivering um, heavy boxes, whatever, UPS, all those people use those ramps probably more so than people with disabilities other than people in wheelchairs. So these accommodations that are made don't just benefit people with disabilities, but they've, they've benefited everyone. And we wouldn't have those if it were not for, for the efforts of ADA. Correct. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a point where you were influenced by an advocate early on? Um, I know that you said you, you um, thank goodness you didn't experience any type of uh, discrimination or anything like that. But were you still um, were you still impacted anyway in any way by an advocate? And if so, how did they support you? I've had several people in my life that have had an impact on me, and um, uh, it, it uh, my phone's ringing. I'm sorry. It's uh, okay. I, I, and and my first area of advocacy really was for returning Vietnam veterans and disabled veterans. They, they were the first people that I had a, a role in advocating for. With disabled veterans at DAV, I was working on their claims. I was uh, reviewing claims. I was filing claims. I was advocating for their claims to get new benefits or more benefits. So several of my bosses were, were, uh, were, uh, were my advocates, if you will. And it, it leads up to a, a book that I, I read not too long ago uh, and I recommend reading it because it really ties in to what happened to me in my life. And I didn't even realize it uh, because I didn't, I didn't understand what, what it was. The name of the book is Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor, The New Way to, fra to Fast Track Your Career by Sylvia Ann Hewlett. And while it's not specifically related to veterans, disabled veterans, or people with disabilities, it talks about the work life and uh, the difference between a mentor. I think everybody knows what a mentor is, but do you know what a sponsor is? No, maybe many of you do, maybe many of you don't. I didn't understand that. I've had several mentors and sponsors, didn't understand that there were sponsors until later in life. A sponsor is somebody who really kind of sticks their neck out for you. They might be a boss, they might be a coworker, uh, they might be somebody else that has influence over a particular project or something, and that sponsor will 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 say to let's let's say there's a new um, uh, research committee coming up, and uh, the people that's heading up don't don't know you. Well, this sponsor might go to that chair or that person that's leading that new uh, research and say, "Hey, you need to put Ron Brock on that on that uh, committee with you." Uh, he's got this experience, so forth and so on. So that sponsor is putting his or her neck on the line as well as mine. So that's going to encourage me to, and, and to really put extra effort into what I'm doing because I don't want to embarrass myself and I don't want to embarrass the sponsor. So I had mentors earlier on in my career and I knew what a mentor was. But I just, you know, probably five years ago when I read the book about, uh, be, you know, uh, being a sponsor. So it's, it's very, very good. So it wasn't until later uh, that I really uh, got into a broader area of people with disabilities. So, so I hear you say that the, the, the sponsor is someone that goes above and beyond. You know, you can have a mentor that offers advice and maybe tells you what you should do, um, what you shouldn't do, but that sponsor goes the extra mile and, and advocates on your behalf. And like you said, puts their neck on the line to see you succeed. Correct. Yes. Correct. So, it's so I'm sorry. It's a good book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we're going to put the name of that um, too for, for everyone out there to, to pick that up. Um, so when, at what point did you know that you wanted to be a disability advocate or, or sponsor? Um, was there a particular experience that inspired you to want to advocate for others? 
this was really an exciting opportunity that occurred that did not at the time mean a whole lot. But when I look back on it, it was the, 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 the experience that led me to be more of an advocate for people with disabilities beyond veterans. When I, when I came back, as I mentioned, I, I'm an amputee. I did not have, I let my driver's license expire when I was in Vietnam, my Pennsylvania driver's license. So when I came back, I had to reapply and take another driver's test. And when I took the driver's K test, I would, was fine. I had no problems. I did everything right. And uh, the state policeman that was in the car with me, he said, um, he said, you're driving with your left foot. He said, I understand that. He said, but you know, you have a disability. I have to put something, some limitation on your driver's license. What should I put on? I said, hmm, how about a hand dimmer switch? Well, back in those days, you couldn't turn your high beams on and off with a gear shift uh, lever. You had to you had to do it with a foot pedal or a metal or a little metal tab, if you will. Uh, so they would they installed a, a, a little toggle switch that allowed me to do that. So that was the only restriction I had on my driver's license until I went to um, when I moved to Virginia. Then when I applied for a driver's license in Virginia, they asked me if I had any impairment that would prohibit me from uh, driving a vehicle with, uh, safely, and I said no because I didn't. So anyway, when I, when, I, when I went to work for DAB, a lot of disabled veterans were coming into the office complaining that they were being discriminated against by their auto insurance. They were being denied auto insurance because of their disability. And I said, well, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, as I recall, insurance premiums are based on your driving record not your ability or disability. So I called my insurance agent and I asked him and he said, yeah, you're right. You know, it has nothing to do with your disability. They, my premiums were never affected because I had a, a, you know, the left leg driver. So anyway, I went to my boss who was one of my first sponsors and I said, we have to do something about this. And he said, what do you want to do? Go ahead and do it. So I wrote to the Pennsylvania insurance commissioner figuring what do I got to lose? Let's see what happens. Well, I wrote a letter explaining what was going on and it didn't take too long, maybe two weeks. I got a letter back from the uh, insurance commissioner for Pennsylvania telling me that yes, that was illegal. And he sent an edict out to all the insurance companies basically saying you cannot deny insurance. You cannot charge excess premiums or extra premiums because of their disability. That's based on their record. So that was my first real experience of pre-ADA, um, you know, positive advocacy on behalf of somebody with a disability. So that really got the fires burning. And I, I can only imagine the sense of, of, of pride and accomplishment that you must have felt when you were able to, to make that change happen, when you were able to push that through. Yeah, the fact that the insurance commissioner of the state would respond to my letter, <laughs> not only respond to it, but respond positively. Yes, that, that's awesome. That's amazing. Um, so in your, your work, um, not just with um, feeling self-empowered, but in your work empowering others, have you ever encountered any pushback with a company or organization that was reluctant to accommodate their employees with disabilities? And if so, how did you advise them? How were you able to offer support? Well, let's, let's work from here and go back a little bit to reverse it just a little bit. Right now, uh, employers, and I, I'm, I, I'm involved with a lot of employer groups and talk to a lot of employers and have the last 15, 20 years since post 9-11, right after 9-11. And, and employers today, large and small for the most part are not at all reluctant to, to make accommodations. They, there's not a whole lot of pushback. Most of it is, is uh, unknown. You know, they, they may not know what's out there. And, but rather than, than take a negative step, they typically reach out to get information so that uh, number one, they don't want to get dinged by the ADA or any other law. Uh, so that's part of it. But the other part of it is I think their commitment is really, really there 
and has been at least for the last 15 years or so, uh, starting when the, when those severely wounded and injured came back, started coming back in 2005, et cetera. Uh, so I think right now the environment is very, very accommodating. Employers are very willing, and, and most businesses and others are very willing uh, to, to, to do what it takes to accommodate people. Uh, they just sometimes don't know what they need to be, what they need to do. And, and my advice to anybody that, uh, whether it's an employer or anybody else that ask a question about uh, making an accommodation, I tell them, ask the person. I know what accommodations I need more so than you do. Uh, I need a hearing assistive devices. Uh, that's the only accommodation I've ever needed. Now I have, I need captioning. We have captioning on this, on this call. Uh, I need captioning to communicate. I can talk to you okay, but when you talk to me, for the most part, I can't either hear you or understand you because word discrimination is one of my bigger problems than actually hearing. So let, let's go back to uh, prior to ADA. Uh, and again, when you hand the, the period, Vietnam was technically or officially over in 1975. So with the, with the exception of some skirmishes from 75 to 90, we didn't really have any wartime uh, going on. There wasn't a lot of wounded ill or injured veterans coming back. So it wasn't much of an issue, but let's go from from uh, let's say 1970 to 1985 uh, or 1980 maybe, uh, most employers did not look for accommodations. They really, nobody really knew what an accommodation was. Although we had accommodations, it just wasn't really a known entity. People didn't really know what an accommodations were other than the, the curb cuts were, were pretty popular and pretty common uh, request among people with, uh, that used wheelchairs. Uh, but beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot of demand. I, I didn't see a lot of pushback in terms of accommodations. The pushback was in actual hiring. They, I mean, they were very blatant. You have a hearing impairment. You have an amputation. You're missing a finger. You have post-traumatic stress. I ain't going to hire you. And guess what? They, they got away with it. There wasn't a thing you could do until the Rehabilitation Act of 73 as amended in 74, that, that is still some, uh, the experts uh, say that, that those laws prohibited discrimination as well as uh, requiring affirmative action. So what it did, it did provide a avenue of, uh, of redress so that a complaint could be filed with the government, either EEOC or the Department of Labor so that, that helped in that, uh, in my dealing with employers that were recalcitrant to hiring people, particularly veterans with disabilities, file a complaint. You know, I'll just file a disability complaint under the, under the Rehab Act. And veterans um, had a similar provision, but it wasn't quite as strong. And you know, it, it's interesting, even to today, veterans, and disabled veterans as a class do not have civil rights. There's nothing in the Civil Rights Act, there's nothing in the ADA that protects veterans as a class. Certainly as a person with a disability, I'm covered under the ADA, but think about that. The people that put their lives on the line, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, I got drafted, I did what I had to do, but we as a class do not have any civil rights. Uh, to me, that is just absolutely mind boggling. So anyway, one day, I guess it was in late seventies, early eighties, I, I, I'm in my office and I look around and I see this desk drawer full of complaints that I filed. A couple got resolved favorably. Some just went on and on and on. And I said, you know, I'm not getting anywhere filing complaints. So I started approaching with a carrot uh, rather than a stick. And so when I get a, a, an inquiry from a disabled vet saying I've been discriminated against, I would reach out to the employer. And more often than not, the employer, once I talked to them and kind of gave them a veiled threat that I'm gonna file a complaint with the government, um, they, they, they came around for the most part. So it became, it became, I think that was really the start 
In, and I remember an article that came out in US News, US News and World Report in 1975 about how, how stable Vietnam disabled veterans were. And all of a sudden it changed the whole, the whole uh, dynamic of hiring veterans and people became very positive and looking and reaching out to disabled veterans. When, when, when you say that, that disabled veterans and, and, and disabled people in general, um, this, the largest class with, with, with no rights, that is my modeling to me as well. And when I think about, it, I saw a statistic that, that people with disabilities are the largest minority group. They're our largest minority group. What do you think it would take for people with disabilities to get the rights that they so that they so rightly deserve, what, what, what do you think would have to happen? Well, well, the the ADA is technically the Civil Rights Act for people with disabilities because it covers various areas. So it really and it prohibits discrimination. So that that's the key. Just as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination, the ADA. Uh, but does it also? So again, me as a person with a disability, I have civil rights under the ADA. Me as a disabled veteran, as a class in a class of disabled veteran, I don't have civil rights. That's upsetting. That's very upsetting. Um, let, let me ask you this: Do you find that do you find that individuals are sometimes reluctant? to advocate for the supports that they need? And, and how do you empower people to disclose their disability or to request the accommodations that they need to be successful? You're looking at one of them. Uh, I am very terrible at self-advocating for myself. My wife advocates for me better than I do. Uh, and I do something uh, I've never really had to worry about, uh, you know, uh, uh, asking for accommodation because I never needed them until I started losing my hearing. And I had a very um, reasonable boss. I mean, he understood what was going on and he was very, you know, accommodating and did what he needed to do in terms of supporting me, getting my, my hearing devices through the government, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I again, I, but I, I do something and I continue to do it and I know I'm not supposed to do it. I apologize for not being able to hear. And that is the direct opposite of self-advocacy. Instead of saying, you need to speak up, you need to speak slower, or you need to provide captioning you know, on, on, your, on your webinar. Instead of doing that, I, I say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand because I don't hear well. I, I, I'm very, very guilty of that. Um, and I, one of these days I'll get over it. Um, but yes, uh, and, and you know, when you talk about this generation of veterans, uh, you know, the, the term used is wounded warrior, not disabled vet. So anybody that got wounded, ill or injured after 9-11, they, they at some point in the probably mid 2000s, around 2005, this, this group of wounded warriors uh, said, I'm not disabled, I'm not handicapped, and I don't want to be tagged as such. Thus was born the term wounded warrior. Uh, so that's, and that gave also spring to the Wounded Warrior Project, which I was on the board for 10 years, and it was one of the founders, is, I am one of the founders, uh, and it was a chair of the, of the board for five years, but, or four years. But, um, there, there's, there's, there's a new book coming out, and it's not out yet. It'll be out September 7th. That was uh, written by a friend of mine, a co-worker on, uh, in the consulting world that I'm doing. Uh, it's called Demystifying Disability. I'm sorry, Demystifying Disability uh, by Emily Ladeau, L-A-D-E-U. Uh, Emily talks about the whole gamut about disability and about self-advocacy and about what people without disabilities can do to avoid embarrassing themselves or embarrassing the person with a disability. You know, if you see somebody in a wheelchair, you should never go up behind him or her and start pushing their wheelchair. It's okay to say, 
do you need some help? Can I give you a hand? Something like that's fine. It's okay to hold a door open, uh, but you would do that anyway for anybody mm-hmm. normally. Uh, but you you just don't you don't overreact to seeing somebody a disability. When when I first came home, I I love this story. Uh, a friend of mine took me gro- or took me shopping at the mall. I was uh, still on crutches. I was walking on crutches. Well, he had some more shopping to do, so I went outside in front and. I sat on a bench in front of the store, uh, the mall, and I was on crutches, so my my you know residual limb was hanging out, no prosthesis. And this, um, a woman and her, her son, he was probably five or six years old, um, came up to me and he asked me what happened. And I said, oh, I lost my leg. And he got down on his knees looking under the bench and said, can I help you find it? Oh. I mean, <laughs> that just like ripped my heart out. It was just unbelievable. But what a what a nice you know what a what a nice thing. And again, going back, if I may, back in Pittsburgh, and I guess in many many places where we grew up uh, back in those days, who was the disabled person you saw? The guy on the street corner with a pencils with a cup with pencils begging for money. And honestly, when I woke up and and in search after surgery and realized that I had lost a leg. That's the image that I had of myself. Worked in a steel mill, blue collar, no college, high school graduate that luckily I made it through. Um, and I, I had no, there was no role models. Now you've got role models coming out of the wall. So anyway. Thank you for that. And, I, and I'm glad that you, um, that you offered that, that advice. You know, when you see someone in a wheelchair, you know, you don't just assume and, 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 and go to push them. And I, I think that, I think people mean well. I think people, you know, naturally want to be helpers, um, but there, there's a right way to go about it. And, and like you said, you know, holding the door, you would normally do that for anyone, um, but we shouldn't assume that someone needs our help because people don't always right. need help. They don't need our help. So thank you for that. Um, and, and something that you said really resonated with me when you, you said that um, how difficult it is sometimes for you to um, speak up for yourself or, you know, you apologize because you, you um, maybe can't hear something and how your wife, uh, Mrs. Drop, who I know and love, how she is your fierce advocate. And I think about, I think about other servicemen and women that I know. Um, including my dad. My dad is a Vietnam vet. And I think about um, how, how, um, how selfless people like him are, people like you are. And they don't always speak up for themselves. They'll be the first one to speak up for someone else, to help others, but don't always speak up for themselves. So I, I just was wondering, you know, what would you say to someone with a disability who um, yeah, I, I says, think we touched on it a little bit on the previous question, but let's get more specific with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, this generation of wounded warriors, uh, and you know, let's distinguish a little bit between uh, veterans, wounded warriors, and, and people with disabilities. Uh, this generation does not want accommodations. They don't want to admit that they need anything. And when I talk to them, and I've talked to many, many over the years, not so many recently, but back, you know, from 05 or 02, actually, when I went to work for the Department of Labor until I retired in 010. And then I still was with Wounded Warrior Project up until about 2013, 2014. Uh, so I, I'm not coming in touch with as many Wounded Warriors as I did during that 10-year period uh, when I was seeing an awful lot of them. And... Um, and what I try to encourage them to do is if you need something, don't be afraid to ask for it. You know what your limitations are. Don't let somebody else define your limitations by telling you what you can do and what you can't do. And this generation does that. They know that. They're, 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 they're probably the strongest advocates of anybody that's ever lived in this country or perhaps in the world that advocate advocating for themselves. They, they go after things. Uh, they don't settle for you know, a no answer. Uh, they're very, very 
uh, positive about life. They're very positive about getting things done. So unless they're really, really severely injured, uh, they're not going to need an accommodation. If they do need an accommodation for work, more often than not, they're going to bring it with them. Uh, one of, one of the um, early accommodations that were available for this generation because of the high incidence of head injuries, uh, with the head injuries, there was a high incidence of cognition issues. So they were forgetting their medical appointments. They were forgetting this, they were forgetting that. Uh, the Department of Defense has a program called CAP. Uh, um, oh, shoot, I forget what the acronym stands for now. Uh, anyway, it's, it's accommodations that were provided for federal employees. And Dinah Cohen, who was a good friend of mine, uh, ran that program. And she was able to get the law changed so that when these wounded warriors were, were being provided this equipment, typically a, a federal employee would have to turn that equipment in when they left the government. She got the law changed so that the, the wounded warriors could keep any adaptive equipment that they got while they were during the transition. So they got to take home these, these um, iPads and other uh, electronic devices where they could keep track of their, uh, of their appointments, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, it also helped them when they went to work, you know, and so forth. Uh, you know, and then um, the the availability of it, I know there's a question coming up a little bit early later, but there's a, a there's a, a lot of information out there now about accommodations. So when you self-advocate for yourself, you you know where to go. Uh, and it reminds me of, of something my boss told me, and, and this was a, my second sponsor, uh, my boss when I got promoted at DAV. And... Uh, he told me, I don't expect you to know the answer, but I expect you to know where to find it. That was, you know, 50 years before Google. Uh, so, you know, you did your own research. You went to the library. You know, you did it physically. You did it manually. Uh, so this generation is very, very savvy about what's going on and knows about the information that's out there. Um, not so much people with disabilities. People with disabilities... Uh, there's a, a very, very broad mixture of, of some that are very strong advocates, some that will never, ever um, uh, uh, stand by and be walked on, if you will, or be denied anything without a fight. So it, it, it and that would be my advice to and any uh, per person with a disability that's having a problem with employment or access to the library or whatever, go out and fight for what's, what's right. And if need be, file a complaint. Absolutely. I, I know you said um, now these days companies and organizations um, are, are very um, proactive when it comes to, to accommodating those with disabilities um, without pushback. But throughout your experience, just thinking back even before the ADA, did you notice, um, was, there, was there a difference in how willing companies were to, to help um, when it comes to invisible disabilities versus visible disabilities? That's a very interesting question because you have a whole array of invisible disabilities. You have heart conditions, you have uh, diabetes, um, you have bad backs, uh, you have epilepsy, uh, you have a whole range of hidden disabilities. You have mental health issues, you have post-traumatic stress disorder, you have mild traumatic brain injury. Um, there are a few major employers, federal contractors, defense contractors, who are very accommodating. And I've actually done a lot of research or uh, outreach to veterans with um, traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And one at least has a very active program um, that uh, recruits and hires and uh, accommodates and works with uh, veterans with traumatic brain injury and PTSD and my hat's off to them for, for their efforts. Uh, back in 2007, when I was at the Department of Labor, because of the uh, TBI and the PTSD, the Department of Labor working in my office with the Office of Disability Employment Policy, we initiated a program called America's Heroes at Work. And what it was, it was, it was designed as an outreach and education effort to employers and others, but mainly employers 
about the, the positives of on hiring people with traumatic brain injury and uh, post-traumatic stress, as well as accommodations and other areas that were there. We, uh, we, we got success stories. We interviewed veterans that were successful with TBI and posted those stories. We, put, we interviewed em employers who did successful employment of those individuals. And they talked about how easy it was and how what accommodations they did or didn't do. Uh, so it was a very, very positive effort. Regrettably, it only lasted for about three years and there's not much going on there right now. So if, you, if, you, if an employer sees somebody with a visible disability, uh, they know what they're dealing with. The other thing with a, with a physical disability is, is you may have a fairly good handle on how much time off you're gonna need for medical care. I, I have an amputation, okay. I, I, I think the only time I took off sick leave for my amputation was to get fitted for a new leg. Um, I didn't need constant medical care. You have a hidden disability, you know, like diabetes or, or mental health issues. The employer is gonna be a little timid because how much time is this person gonna need? Uh, and, and you know, a, a very simple example of an accommodation for somebody that has um, diabetes and is on insulin, have access to a small refrigerator somewhere in the, in the office. And you know, a lot of offices have small refrigerators. Uh, and if not, let me, let, let me bring my own in and plug it in my own office or my own cubicle. Uh, it's very simple, reasonable accommodation. Um, and, and as a diabetic, the person that's on insulin knows that they need to refrigerate their insulin. The employer, maybe not so. So here's what you self-advocate for yourself. Yeah, I'm a diabetic, I'm on insulin, blah, blah, blah. But there's still maybe some reluctance because of the uh, reaction that some people have, you know, if they don't get their medicine, uh, if they eat the wrong food, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my God, what an epilepsy. What if somebody has an epileptic fit, you know, um, which is in and of itself discriminatory. It's a seizure, it's not an epileptic fit, uh, but people, you know, they stereotype. So um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, and I think Emily's book that I mentioned, uh, Demystify, is going to be provide a lot of information. So put it on your calendar for some, and I get, and I'm getting no money back from uh, promoting Emily's book. Uh, but you know, it's it's a good uh, primer, I think, for for that. And, and incidentally, while I'm speaking of books, I know we're getting short on time. Um, um, if you want to know more about the history of the ADA and the disability movement, I'm going to recommend another book. And this one I have here in front of me. Uh, if I can find it in front of my camera. Oh, it's not showing up very well. Anyway, it's called Being Human, H-E-U-M-A-N, which is uh, the name of the author, Judy Human. I've known Judy since 1972. She, was, uh, she wrote a very, very good book about her personal life as a person in a wheelchair and how uh, her mother was her strongest advocate, getting her into school and so forth and so on. It's a very, very good book. From a, from a perspective of an individual story, but also how that individual story uh, sort of morphed into the advocacy. Also, Judy, and I've not seen this, uh, this, this uh, documentary, but you've seen it on the news, Netflix has it, uh, is uh, Crip Camp, C-R-I-P Camp. Um, Judy's in it, uh, they're, oh, they're, they, they made the video, it was up for an Academy Award, it didn't win. They're also making a movie of Judy's book. I'm not sure when it'll be out, uh, but it's going to be a while. So I, I got that. So those those are uh, a, a couple of uh, ideas that I have about going back to, to learn more about the disability movement. Actually, I can share with you. Uh, we we had a visit from from Ms. Human. She she we we had a program where she spoke to our Penn State World Campus community, and we had a screening of the documentary Crip Camp. So we're very familiar. It's an excellent, excellent film. Yes, we, we have a question and, I, and I'm glad it came through because I was going to say, if anyone has questions, please to, uh, to, to send them. Um, we have one from a Mr. Goldstraw, Robert Goldstraw. Um, he says, great to hear your personal reflections on these many topics, Ron, especially about mentors versus sponsors in Emily's book. 
Love the story about the boy offering to help find your leg. <laughs> a memory from my mother who grew up with polio from age 13. Um, he said that she passed a few years ago um, at age 89, uh, pre-ADA. When we were kids, she took us to a store to buy a gift for a friend's birthday. Walking into the department store with heavy metal leg braces, a cane, and three kids in tow, the salespeople just kind of stared, gawking at her from afar until she lifted her cane, banged it down on the counter, and said in a very loud but polite voice, excuse me, but the lady with the cane needs service. <laughs> In short order, she had five people <laughs> waiting on her. Fortunately, many people with disabilities are not shy. <laughs> so that kind of speaks to what you said. You have to be vocal and, and speak up for yourself, just as Bob's mother did. Well, that's a, that's a good, good question, Bob. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, example of somebody self-advocating. And I, I love that story. But it also reminds me of a story that... Um, Harold Russell used to tell. Harold Russell lost both hands in World War II in an accident and was the head of the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities for many, many years. And um, he was he and a, a, a fellow person with a disability who was blind were, uh, and he's walking around with two hooks and they were driving from point A to point B and they stopped to get gas. And uh, somebody, uh, the gas station attendant or someone uh, asked Harold, uh, how he drives with no hands. And Harold said, no, I'm not driving. He is the guy with the dark glasses, the blind guy, uh, uh, which I, he, Harold used to tell that much funnier than I did. But um, I, again, I think it gets down to the self-advocacy, you know, and, and people tend to be nervous around people with disabilities because they don't know what to do. Uh, they don't know how to act or how to react. Uh, to people in a wheelchair. They don't know uh, where, the, where, where the person's coming from or where they should uh, go. So a lot of, you know, what they call normies uh, might just walk away if they see somebody in a wheelchair or a blind person with a white cane or even myself in a, you know, uh, with, uh, with a, a limp. Uh, they, they, they sometimes they look with curiosity. Sometimes they look with disdain. Sometimes they look away. Uh, and I think the more, and we've seen this happen, Bob, you know, the last probably since 1970, give or take, uh, we've seen more and more people with disabilities out and about. And the more we are out there, the more we're going to be accepted, the more we're going to become commonplace. Now, I think a lot of times you see somebody in a wheelchair at, 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 the, uh, uh, you know, at the grocery store, it, it's not that big of a deal anymore. And the other thing, and I used to love to do this, I did it a lot uh, talking to the high school, or grade school kids. When my, when my daughter, two daughters were growing up, I spoke to their school classes several different times about um, you know, being an amputee. And I used to take my crutches and my outriggers for when I skied on, uh, 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 skiing on one, on one leg and outriggers. And I would talk to them about that. And you know, the sooner we educate the young people the sooner they're going to be accepting and the sooner they're, they're not going to be, you know, looking askance or looking with curiosity uh, and not be afraid to come up. And I've had, you know, uh, parents with young children uh, come up to me and ask me, is it okay if, if Johnny asks you a question? Or, you know, I welcome that. I want you to do that. I want to tell you how I'm doing. I want to tell you what happened. Uh, so if, if you see somebody with you know with a disability and you have questions for the most part don't be afraid to approach them and talk to them and i think uh emily's book is, is going to get into a lot of that more than this than i am so i i hope that answers your question at least partially i think that's perfect advice that's how we learn that's how we grow by asking questions and i think sometimes as adults we need to take a take a cue from kids who aren't afraid to ask questions and just, just to learn and understand. We have one final um, comment that I think is a perfect comment to close with. Uh, it's from a Mr. Francisco Puejo. Um, he says, thank you for your time. Uh, he says, I'm a Iraq war veteran and this seminar was very educational. And he says, thank you, sir, for your service, Semper Fidelis.
I hope I said that right. Thank you. And like I said, I think that's a, a perfect way to wrap up. Um, and I can't thank you enough, uh, Mr. Drock. Um, I, I appreciate your, your time, your, your candor, your experience. Um, and, and I hope that everyone here found this evening as enlightening and as exciting as I did. Um, I just wanna again, thank you for just sharing your, your, your experience with us. And I know that you graciously offered to continue the conversation with anyone who wants to follow up with you, with anyone who wants to reach out to you personally. So um, if, if uh, uh, I see, yes, your, your email address is there. So I would encourage anyone who wants to further a conversation with Mr. Drock to reach out to him. Um, if anyone uh, would like to contact me with any questions, any comments uh, to continue the conversation, my email address is available as well. And I'm more than glad to, to continue a dialogue. So having said that again, thank you. Thank you for your time and everyone, thank you for joining us and please be well. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.